Dr. Casanova, senior fellow at the Davis Center of Harvard University, is currently focusing her research on Central Asia. Our discussion focused on the ongoing Chinese investment in this region, as well as Sino-Kazakh water management and why Kazakhstan is the buckle of the belt for BRI in Central Asia. My name is Nargis Kasenova. Now I'm a senior fellow at the Harvard Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies. Um, but prior to that, um, that is until, until September 2018, I was um, based at Kimap University in Almaty. And um, I was teaching a number of courses, including Central Asian Global Politics. I also taught a course on uh, rise of China and global governance. Um, but my general field of expertise sort of is uh, um, Central Asia, Central Asian global politics, Central Asian politics, geopolitics, basically. And the Belt and Road Initiative is, is, a, is a, a Chinese development strategy impacting a lot of regions. How is it manifesting itself in Central Asia? Um, well, in a variety of ways, but, but we need also to keep in mind that um, Belt and Road Initiative was launched in 2013, a Silk Road Economic Belt, uh, but it was uh, building on what was already done yeah, in terms of connectivity. So pretty much we had all the projects. Yeah? We had uh, railway projects, we had pipeline projects, um, uh, growing economic cooperation, people to people, so on and so, so forth. So, uh, but it got broader in, in scope, and of course it uh, became grander, that's for sure. Uh, the rhetoric of BRI is very strong now. Yeah, there are multiple conferences on, on the issue. Um, the number of scholarships went up, the number of, like all kinds of connections went up. And um, uh, also now, I guess the kind of the most important development is that um, uh, national development strategies of Central Asian states are aligned with uh, with Belt and, Ro Belt and Road Initiative. And how, in your opinion, does the Belt and Road Initiative in Central Asia differ from the way it's being implemented in other regions? Like, like which Let's one? take East Africa and some of the comparisons with industrial capacity mm -hmm. cooperation. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I guess one of the specificities is that we're next door. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we are on the way to Europe yeah, by land, uh, so and um, there are important interdependencies in terms of security. Uh, Central Asia is on the other side of Xinjiang, which is pretty important. Yeah, it makes it quite uh, uh, quite special. Um, otherwise, we see co you know common features: yeah, how China interacts with uh, with its regions, what kind of uh, what kind of loans it gives, what kind of uh, assistance, and you know how, how it works in diplomatic terms. So I can't say that it's completely different, but there are some specificities. And I guess Kazakhstan specifically, in the context of Central Asia, is referred to as the buckle. Yeah, the yeah, 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 that's what they say, yeah, yeah. What, why, why, is, why does Kazakhstan get this privileged, this privileged term? Because it is Kazakhstan that is in between China and Europe. You don't even need to cross any other Central Asian Republic. Um, uh, plus, Kazakhstan has uh, resources of its own to invest in projects. And it's quite interesting becoming this transit zone part of the, this buckle on the, um, the Silk Way, whatever we call it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so basically, there is a lot of will and also there is capacity to cooperate. I guess in, 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 in the context of BRI, there's a lot of rhetoric and discussion about the building of transportation and eventually economic corridors which mm -hmm. will span between China and, and Europe. Do you feel that these economic corridors will eventually stretch to Europe? May that be through the Caspian region or through the Eurasian Economic Union and Russia and Belarus? Or do you think it's more about opening up Central Asia and Kazakhstan as a market independent of... Um. I think the prime goal is actually getting to Europe, clearly, because that, that's where the real market is. You know? um, Central Asia is quite small in this regard, so it's not a very, very attractive market. Um, 
but it doesn't mean that one goal you know contradicts um, another but of course now the, the big challenge is to to for central asian states to actually become this kind of active hub on the way rather than just a transit zone i mean with that said uzbekistan in the last i guess within the last 3 years has, has really opened up economically but also shown shown, mm -hmm. shown sort of a similar trend politically too yeah. how has the Belt and Road Initiative responded to that, and is that creating a new market in Uzbekistan? I think it is. Yes, we can we can see um, the Uzbek government very actively opening up, creating conditions for investments, for trade, intra-regional trade, but also extra-regional trades, and um, there've been uh, meetings between the leaders and also a lot of. Uh, a lot of documents signed, um, and there will be investments and so on. So yeah, yeah, th there is pretty good dynamic, uh, and uh, which is particularly good for the region. And you, you don't you don't see it changing any of the pre-existing policies that have been implemented, just building on some of the in increasing trade, FDI, maybe educational cooperation. You don't see it refracting the Belt and Road policy in Central Asia in any way. Uh, reflect, you mean changing changing the policy? Well, everybody is looking at Uzbekistan now and mm. checking what the opportunities are. So, of course, it's not a you know Uzbekistan is a pretty key country. Yeah, it's very central, the the, the largest population, and I think um, once the constraints are removed, they will, the people will be very active economically. So it's not a country to ignore, definitely. Yeah. If we can just turn a little bit east and look at Tajikistan and yes. Kazakhstan. There have been two countries identified by the, by the Center for Policy Development at risk of, 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 of debt default due to the, due to the, uh, the debt to Chinese creditors. Right. Do you think because of this, or, or some of these examples, China through the Belt and Road is operating a deliberate loan-to-own strategy, or would this be unfair to characterize BRI in this way? Um, BRI specifically in Central in, in, Asia. Yeah, in my view, it's not deliberate. Mm -hmm. And actually, uh, China would prefer the loans to be paid in some way. Yeah. Um, so, so I wouldn't say there is a secret strategy of indebting these countries. Yeah. And you never know, you know how it's going to develop this story, yeah? because mm -hmm. they, they might also default on, on, this, uh, on this debt, yeah? like a new government coming to power and say, okay, we have nothing to do with this. And um, so it's quite up unpredictable and uncertain. So I, I don't think there is good business sense, you know, to just make them debt dependent. And you never know how, how it's going to work out with these weak governments, weak, weak states. And I guess the Central Asia used to be a, a strong sphere and still is of, of, sort of Russian influence. Yes. How has... BRI been interacting with the Eurasian Economic Union in Central Asia. Do you see them as, if I can make the sort of the, the, the yeah. dichotomy, competing or complementary in nature? Oh well, uh, the rhetoric is that there is a um, complementarity yeah, between between the two projects, um, and uh, the. Kind of, they talk about linkage, between uh, between yeah, Euro Eurasian Economic Union and uh, uh, Belt and Ro uh, Road Initiative, but uh, de facto on the ground, I don't see much cooperation. Yes, they produce documents. There was an agreement signed last year, uh, but in terms of substance, there is very little, and I, I, it's primarily Russia's position. Yeah. Um, I don't think Russia is that certain it wants the linkage, like strong linkage between between these two projects, because Russia doesn't cannot com compete much in you know in this field. <laughs> they don't have uh, they don't have resources. I mean, on on the subject of competing development strategies, the USA's Build Act has been yes. signed in October yeah. on October two thousand eighteen has been a really important development. How do you see this? competing or working with or against BRI in Central Asia and what, what do you see as the significance of this being? Um, okay, in, I think at core it's, it, is, it is competition, yeah? 
uh, that's why it was conceived and put forward, you know, because, because US policymakers are worried to see how much influence China, China is gaining. Uh, but I think eventually uh, there will be more engagement. Uh, and we can see that um, looking at Japan, how Japan reacts to BRI and what they are trying to do. Um, we see that uh, when we look at the EU um, response to BRI um, and the attempts to create, uh, well, basically they already have a connectivity platform. Yeah? So um, I don't think outright competition is possible and productive, but it does create an interesting dynamic for sure. And transparency and accountability have yes. been two of the issues yes. highlighted yeah. all across the sort of trade economic belt. W w how could the Belt and Road Initiative benefit from increasing these two factors? Well, that, I think that's the biggest challenge. Um, I can see clear benefit because uh, that will make, uh, if, if there is more transparency and accountability, uh, it's more sustainable. Um, and the, uh, well, well, everybody is somewhat afraid of China uh, and lack of transparency and accountability fuels this distrust, distrust of China, fear of China. Um, and also distrust and fear of your own, go you know, what your ro own governments are up to. Uh, so if we don't know what the conditions are, what the deals are, you know, that, that definitely creates a uh, strong suspicion. So, um, so I think the governments engaged in this, and it's not only the Chinese government, but also local governments, they need to, to have more transparency and accountability for sure if they want to continue with this project and to, for, for countries to benefit from this project. Do you see this as something being possible though? I mean, I, I remember you mentioning at the beginning that governance is something that you're focused yeah. on and many of the countries which are part of the Silk Road Economic Belt are more aligned with authoritarian models of government than, 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 yeah. than modern liberal democracies. And of course, as a result, the, the values and norms which are being implemented through the BRI projects are more in line with those systems of thought. Yeah. So is there a incentive to have things as unaccountable and un, untransparent rather than transparent? And, and how can we get around some of these Right, problems? okay. Um. There are incentives for being non-transparent and non-accountable, of course, yeah. The, we talk about uh, um, sometimes narrow interests, group interests, and, you know, when there is money, there are people who want to benefit from this money. Um, and if the political system is not conducive to transparency and accountability, you can have, you know, cases. And we do see these cases, yeah. Um, but... Uh, but at the same time, um, there are pressures coming from different directions to increase this transparency and accountability. Um, there are pressures from, from below, bottom up, uh, when uh, citizens want to know what's going on. Um, and uh, well, the kind of in more democratic setups, that's a, you know, that's a big factor. Um, but also in authoritarian setups, you know, if the public opinion is strongly against, it gets manifested. Yeah, like for example, the the land protest that Kazakhstan had in 2016. Yeah, so um, the activists are in prison, still in prison, but but at the same time, you know, the government put a moratorium on the new legislation on land. So um, so the government was afraid to to move ahead with the plan. Uh, so, so there are these pressures. Then there are pressures from sort of aside, you know, um, the the markets uh, because the the you know the markets they prefer to have predictability, you know, kind of lower risk and uh, so on and so forth. Um, so and the well, Chinese government itself they don't want to use money in a kind of stupid way, you know. Um, they're interested in better management of, of the money, but of course it's, it's very difficult because the system is um, quite fragmented, decentralized, although it looks very centralized, but, but it's not.
Thank you. Um, as far as I understand, Xi Jinping and Nazarbayev, President Nazarbayev, have a, have a strong, both working and personal relationship. And of course, we see, yeah. however one chooses to interpret that, there, there is strong cooperation on the, on, on the sort of high dialogue and bilateral level between Kazakhstan and, Stan and China. But I've, I've noticed that things are sort of the ilio neotish river. There's been discussions about water management issues mm -hmm. and also, of course, uh, nuclear pollution coming across. Um, via, 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 the, via some of the winds from China. Do you see these as being massive pitfalls to future cooperation in the future and more importantly are there other factors? We don't, we don't know much yeah, um, about these negotiations. The government claims that everything is under control and you know kind of they, they, they have these agreements, detailed agreements. But we, we don't know. And potentially that might be an issue. It might be an issue because Xinjiang is developing and they're taking more and more water. And you know we don't know how much water we'll, we will be getting eventually. But um, but at the same time, um, I can refer you to a very good interview we did with uh, Iskander Abdullayev, a water specialist. Uh, he's saying that uh, the our side, Central Asian side, is also to blame because we misuse water. Uh, Ch Chinese side is using water in a much more effective way. You know? uh, and here we are claiming more water, but at the same time we are misusing it. Uh, so if we want to talk to Chinese in a serious way, we need also to improve uh, our, our own water management. Because they say, okay, we have a lot of people, you know, living. You have less people. You know, why? Why do you want to get more water than um, <laughs> than us? And just to finish, if you're happy to uh, s conceptualize or summarize the Belt and Road in one word, and Ooh. if you're also happy to an image and take as long as you need to, uh, I'd love to hear <laughs> your thoughts. What it is? Ah. Oh. It's China. <laughs>